<clears throat> okay, we are starting the section, the last, um, sorry, my brain is dead, genre um, for the course, dealing with poetry. I'm going to ask a question. I pretty much know the answer, but I'll ask anyways. How many of you read poetry? Daily. Yeah, that's what I thought. How many of you listen to poetry? Every one of you does. Whether you're aware of it or not. If you listen to songs, you're listening to poetry. Maybe all you listen to, you know, is instrumental music. I doubt it. Uh, but if you listen to rap, hip hop, anything else, it's poetry of a sort at the very least, okay? Um, one of the most important things that your editor says in the section on reading poetry is the very first sentence on page 589 in the uh, 11th edition. <clears throat> Perhaps the best way to begin reading poetry responsibly is to not allow yourself to be intimidated by it, okay? Most people, the vast majority of people, I would say, whether college students or not, they are intimidated just by the very word, poetry. It comes, the modern word poetry or poem, comes from or is derived from the Greek word, if I'm spelling that right, poesis. And all poesis means, the old Greek word, all poesis means is to make. It's something made. Okay? Because of the conventions of language and the conventions of literature, however, we don't use the word poem to mean anything made. Because otherwise we would say, this is a poem. It's a horrible one. This is a poem. This is, etc. Okay? So we use it to refer to something made of words. But we don't call Hamlet a poem. Hamlet's a drama. Okay? What's the difference between a poem and a drama? Drama goes back to, to the meaning to play. To act, okay? It is something played out in front of people, something acted out in front of people. That's why you can use the term drama to refer to something that you see and that is not a little drama like Hamlet. For example, an election. Elections can be dramatic. Characters or um, politicians can be, you know, described as being in a drama, so to speak. You've heard friends, you may be referred to friends, as being overly dramatic, like they're acting out, okay? That all refers to that kind of genre. A poem, usually what we say is a poem has maybe a rhyme scheme, has a certain rhyme to it, it has a certain meter that is its use of accented and unaccented syllables. We'll talk about these terms as we get to them, okay? So he goes on, talks about, you probably listened to a song several times before you hear it all, before you know how it works, etc., etc. And in, in, here's an example of how important, or how maybe not important, how significant, how influential Poetry in song can be, okay? Um, are any of you Stranger Things fans? Netflix. What was one of the most important things of the recent um, series? The last, not episode, but the last, you know, like five or six part, the recent season. Oh, the, uh, the song is playing. Kate Bush's Running Up the Hill. I'm old enough to, rem to <laughs> have been alive when that song first came out. I was never aware of it in 1985, okay? Um, but 
because it was used in Stranger Things, same thing happened with the um, guitar solo that, uh, what's his name did? Eddie, the Master of By Metallica. By Metallica, okay? Again, old enough fruit when that was new. Both those, Running Up the Hill was the number one song downloaded for, I wanna say weeks, okay? It brought Kate Bush to the number one. She'd never been number one before. She had in the UK. She's the number one woman female artist in the UK for years, okay? Um, almost unheard of in the United States. Why? Just because of its use in that series? Largely because that was, you know, a huge series and had a big audience waiting for it. But because of the song itself and its repetition, its use of rhyme, its all that kind of stuff, okay? So let's just start going through some of these pages. But before we start talking about, for example, writing about poetry, word choice, word order, and tone, let's look at a little poem on 591 by Robert Hayden. Okay, and I'll tell you right now, anything we discuss, any poems that I discuss in class can show up on a quiz or the final exam. The final exam is just gonna be over poetry. So once you do the drama exam, which is due, I don't remember when, sometime next week. It's Monday. Is it Monday? Okay, Monday. Um, once you do the drama exam, only thing, you know, from then on out is the poetry stuff. So Those Winter Sundays by Robert Hayden may be quizzed over or he may show up on the exam. Um, so this is written in 1962 or published, I should say, in 1962. Three stanzas, what, 14 lines. <coughs> Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. Notice how I read those two lines. I didn't pause after the end of the first line. Okay. Talk about that in a moment. Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. Then, with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather, made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call. And slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Okay, so let's go back to that first two lines. Why didn't I pause at the end of the first line? There's no punctuation. So when you have a line of poetry, excuse me, when you have a sentence of poetry that runs over from one line to another, but there's no mark of punctuation at the end, you are intended to just read it without any pause. See, punctuation marks originally were originally oratorical. They were designed for the material, poems are designed to be read aloud. Well, let me rephrase that. Most poems are designed to be read aloud. They're designed, they're written to be heard, okay? When punctuation began over 2,000 years ago, okay? Ancient Greeks were the first ones to invent punctuation. Uh, third or fourth century BC, if I remember correctly. I haven't taught the history of the English language course in a few years, and I talk about it there. It's designed to give pauses for the person delivering a poem or a speech, for example. Okay, and, and the same thing applies not only to poetry, it applies to prose, like fiction, okay? 
po uh, marks of punctuation were given or were introduced to tell us when to pause. And by telling us when to pause, what that really means is telling us when to take a breath. You read so far and you, that's a little pause. So a comma is a short pause. A semicolon is a longer pause, oratorically, not grammatically, all right? Grammatically, punctuation is totally different, okay? So oratorically, that is orally delivering something, a comma is a short pause, a semicolon is a longer pause, a colon is about the same as a semicolon, okay? A period means stop, get a drink, wet your mouth, then go on, okay? Question mark indicates what? Okay, it indicates a question, so what do you do? How do you indicate a question talking? Your voice rises at the end. Is this a question? Rather than, is this a question? That's more of an exclamation, okay? Exclamation means you deliver it louder, okay? Grammatically, a comma separates two clauses. Usually, two clauses, one of which is dependent upon the other one. Doesn't necessarily have to be the first one is dependent upon the second one, or the second one is dependent upon the first. A semicolon separates two independent clauses. That is, each of those clauses can sit alone as a sentence, right? You can use a period as well as a semicolon. A colon does the same. It separates two independent clauses. Usually, however, what a colon does is it introduces often a series that comes after it, okay? A period separates two independent clauses, all right? So, Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black cold. <sighs> Breath. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. <sighs> Pause, stop, longer stop. No one ever thanked him. Notice, the first two lines, you've got the pause after cold, and then you have two and a half lines, okay? So it builds in length, it builds a little complexity, and then the stanza ends with a short, succinct, no one ever thanked him. There's an emphasis there, okay? So what is that stanza telling us? He's not appreciated, okay? Good, what else? What's the second word of the first line telling us? He does it other days too. He does it other days too. In fact, it's not just that he does it other days, it's he does it every day, okay? Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the, what kind of adjective is blue black? <clears throat> Notice it's modifying cold. In the blue-black cold. Dark. Dark. But it's not pitch dark, right? It's blue-black. Like the, the morning, the dusk, right before the sun starts rising. The sun is nearing the horizon, but it's not up yet. So as you look towards the horizon, I know I'm looking wrong direction, but if you're looking towards the horizon, it would still be blue. It's not yet yellow and orange and such, but if you look directly overhead or to the west, it would be what? Black. It'd be dark, okay? So it's early morning still. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black cold. Then with cracked cans that ached from labor in the weekday weather made bank fires blaze. So what does this guy do for a living? Blue collar work. At the very least, we know he doesn't work in an office, right? How? His hands are cramped from what? Labor in the weekday weather. So where did, does he work in a garage? No, he works outside. 
He works outside in the sun. His hands are not only beaten down by the work he does, but by the elements, whether it's sunny or stormy, okay? And what would he do in the blue, black, cold? Make blank, uh, banked fires blaze. What's meant by banked fires? Like start a fire in a fireplace. Okay, but how? Is he starting from scratch? Is he putting wood and paper in and starting it that way? No, he's stirring up the ashes. He's stirring up the hot embers. If you've ever built a fire, we used to have a wood stove when I was growing up. Um, if you've ever built a fire in a wood stove, the idea is you build it up at night before you go to bed. So that in the morning, you'll have ashes sitting in a pile, but beneath the, cut, the top of those ashes, there will be coals that are still hot. And in the wood stove we had, you would shake the grate that the, everything was sitting on, the ash would jiggle through, and then you just have the hot coals. Then you put kindling on top of that, that's the banked fire. You put kindling, burst into flame, okay? And that's when we get, no one ever thanked him. So why does he do it if no one ever thanks him? It's become an expectation of him. It's become an expectation of him? Like a duty of his. That's more the point. Okay? And notice the title. I didn't say anything about the title. Titles are always important. They give you a roadmap. They tell you where you're going. Those winter Sundays. Notice it's not those summer Sundays. You wouldn't build a fire in the Sunday. In the summer, okay? So, second stanza. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. How would you hear the cold splinter or break? Wood. Okay. How, what kind of wood? Be more specific. So like hardwood floors or something? They'll, they'll contract and expand with heat and cold. Hardwood flo floors? Walls, if they're not concrete block, even if they have drywall on them, they expand and contract, okay? That's why builders today, and for the last 40, 50 years, they wrap a house, Tyvek and material like that, it helps do what? It helps stabilize the internal temperature of a house. Obviously, this house does not have what? Insulation. Insulation, what else? thermostat. You don't just go up and turn the thermostat up, heat the house up. This house is heated by wood fire or possibly coal, okay? Uh, I grew up in a house in California. House was built in the late 40s, stucco house, okay? We had, we did have heaters, but for some reason we stopped using them and went to all wood. So we had a pot belly stove in the living room and you'd heat that fire up and even though it didn't get really cold, I mean, this is North Central California, we would get temperatures in the 20s every now and then, but not like here. But still, when that, if you would start a fire early in the morning, you would hear the rest of the house creak. Our roof was solid wood, okay, redwood. And when that roof would heat up, you'd kind of hear it. I lived for a while, my wife and I, right after we got married, lived in a log cabin, this was down in Chattanooga on Lookout Mountain. These log cabins were built for summer housing, like back in the 30s or 40s. People would come stay in them for a week or two weeks, that kind of thing. They were pretty old. The chinking, which is the mortar that goes between the logs, was in really bad shape. You could see daylight. I mean, you could look at the wall and you could see daylight at a lot of points, okay? When we got married, the winter before we got married, the January before we got married, it was January 1985, massive cold spell hit the, the eastern United States. It was zero, excuse me, it was below zero on Lookout Mountain for three days straight, okay? That log cabin... Water in the toilet, for example, in the bowl and in the tank, froze solid. All right? So I stapled blankets up on the walls. 
because you could see daylight through it. And when the wind would blow, that, those blankets would sway. But when I started a fire in the wood stove, I mean, it was like you're almost, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not, this isn't real hyperbole. It was almost like popping popcorn because of the sound of those walls, those logs expanding and contracting. That's why the chinking was so bad, by the way. People build fires in the winter and the mortar expands and contracts and it chips away. So that's what the speaker's telling us. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call. Why? It's time to start the day. Time to start the day. Time to get up. Notice when he doesn't do it. He doesn't do it when it's still cold. This gets back to your idea of this, it's kind of a duty. It's an office that the father performs. Okay? He'd call and slowly I would rise and dress. Now, I'm not going to do the last line yet. If, we, if, if you didn't know the last line at this point, why would you think the speaker slowly rises and gets dressed? He's tired. Tired? Groggy. Groggy. Why else? He didn't have anywhere to be. Louder? He didn't have anywhere to be. Didn't have anywhere to be. It's Sunday morning, we're told by the title. When you're asleep and under the covers... Under the blankets, you're what? Cozy. You're cozy and warm. Okay? You throw those covers off even if the room is warming up and you're still hit with not whatever the temperature is under those blankets. The room temperature. Okay? That's the assumption. Or at least that's my assumption. When I read that line, slowly I would rise and rise. But it's also the grogginess. You're just waking up. And then we get that, that last line. How does that last line work? Fearing the chronic angers of that house. That last line, kind of, I'm not saying that it literally does. It kind of works as what's called an appositive. Okay? An appositive is when you have a noun given and then usually a comma in a phrase or a clause. The phrase or the clause expands upon the noun. Okay? Gives it more meaning, gives it more definition. So, slowly I would rise and dress, comma, the whole next line does what? It tells us why the person slowly rises and dresses. It modifies the previous line. Fearing the chronic angers of that house. How can a house be chronically angry? Always, like, always tension or something? Is it the house, first of all? It's the family. It's the family. It's the people in the house. And notice, we're told it's chronic, which means what? Long it's consistent, it's long time, it's been going on, and it's anger. As opposed to, what would be the opposite of anger? Love. Comma. Comma. That second stanza ends with a comma. So with the comma and, if, and with it being a stanza break, Long pause. Speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. Those three lines all do what? What do they modify? The chronic angers of that house. Or, or, does it go back to the I? 
See, one thing about poetry that's different than fiction and drama is poetry is intentionally ambiguous. The more ambiguous a poet can be in a line, in a word, in a poem, the more successful the poem will be. Why? Because you can read it one way, and I can read it one way, and you can read it one way, and you can. It opens up possibilities of meaning. Does that mean all our readings would be valid? No, it doesn't. Because if you read this and tell me it's talking about UFO abduction, I would say you are wrong. You are absolutely wrong. And you would say, well, how do you know? And I would reply, tell me where UFOs and abduction are anywhere, one, explicitly referred to, or two, implied. None of the words in, in that poem imply or suggest that in any way. So every interpretation has got to be tied to the actual words. So I'll go back to those three lines. Uh, let me go back to the second stanza. Slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Pause. Speaking indifferently to him. Pause. Who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. So go, go to the third stanza. The second and third line are a positives, right? They are one long a positive phrase modifying what noun or pronoun? Him, okay? But the three lines together go back to something previously. And that's the, I think, chronic angers of that house. It's the chronic angers of the house that are speaking indifferently to him. What's it mean to speak indifferently? What does it mean to be indifferent? Give me a one word phrase that indicates indifference. Okay. So okay. Can be, depending upon how you say it. I said so so. So so? Two words. Huh. Or hyphenated. Whatever. Whatever means what? Whatever you want. What's a longer phrase that means whatever? I don't care. I don't give a damn. Okay? That's what, that's indifference. Indifference is total apathy to what somebody else has said. Okay? So, the chronic angers of the house are speaking indifferently to him. Are they literally speaking? No. No. They're saying, I don't care. I don't care what you do. And yet, what does the father do? Seemingly, every Sunday. Gets up early when everybody else is asleep. His hands are tore, tired and sore and cracked. And he builds up the fire and he warms up the house. And once the house is warm, then he gets, wakes everybody up who apparently doesn't give a damn. Okay? So, speaking indifferently to him, again, there is the possibility that that does go back to the eye. Like the father says, good morning, yeah, whatever. Who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. So why does he polish the good shoes? So they're getting ready, they're going to go to church. And not only has he warmed the house up, but he's taken a few minutes to polish the shoes. Do we know the, the sex of the speaker? Male or female? We don't, right? At least up to this point, we don't. What did I know? What did I know? Why is it repeated? Emphasis. Emphasis. Keep going. What's the tense? Uh, past. It's past tense. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? 
So why emphasize it? Maybe something bad happened. Okay, possibly. They feel guilty. Possibly. I mean, those are both entirely valid. They didn't understand the love that um, their father had for him at the time. Keep going. You're ninety percent there. Um, didn't understand the love the father had for them at the time. When you would get up and, and do those things for him, and then they never like appreciated him for it. Yep. Now he's probably gone. So now maybe dad is dead. Okay. What else? Maybe they have to do it now. That's what I think Hayden is getting at. The author. Okay. What did what did I know? What did I know then? And it's repeated, emphasizing I was a jerk. I didn't understand it all. What did I know of what? Not of everything Dad did before. Because what the speaker does is the speaker extrapolates, talks about the literal things the speaker's father did, and then generalizes to what that really is. Love's austere and lonely offices. Not offices in the sense of a nine to five office. What's another word for office? Workplace, that kind of gets at the nine to five thing. Duty. But literally another word for office is one's duty. Okay? If you're an office holder, it doesn't just mean like an elected office holder. It doesn't just mean you have a room in a building in the Capitol. It means you have a duty a responsibility, an obligation. Why? Because of the faith, you know, people putting you for electing you. So what are the loves, lonely, and austere offices that the speaker seemingly now understands? Notice, austere. What is, what is meant by austere or austerity? What happens when a government has to implement austerity measures? We don't do that very much in the United States because we kind of, you know, doesn't matter the party. Both parties say, we want you to be fat, dumb, and happy, and we're not going to make you suffer. When you're put into austerity measures, people suffer. Okay? What, what's one of the, I don't, I'm not getting off on the politics. But what's one of the big problems facing the country today? Not facing the country today, but it's going to be facing you guys and your children a lot more than it will be me. We're like $31 trillion in debt. So how do you get out of 30? I can't even imagine that amount of money. I can't imagine $31 million. But how do you get out of that kind of debt? There are two ways. Actually, there's not, but you know, there are two ways. Print more money, right? We've tried that, it doesn't work. That's why inflation is up. What's the other way? Take the 31 trillion and make it your bank account. What happens when you don't make enough money to get by? What do you have to do? File for bankruptcy. <laughs> File for bankruptcy is one thing. Because that does what? It magically makes it disappear, right? I mean, you then have a hard time getting credit and stuff. But imagine you're not going by credit. You've got four bucks. And you're hungry. And you need to buy some food. And you look at a menu. Or you look at you know your options. And what you really want is going to cost you eight bucks. Do you go and buy the $8? No, you don't. What do you do? You buy what costs four bucks or a little bit less so you have some change. In other words, austerity is going without. It's going with less than what one wants. Austerity is, you know, the minimal. So how is austere 
loves austere in lonely offices. How can love be austere? Okay, it doesn't exist, but it did on the Father's part, right? What did the Father receive? Nothing. In return, nothing. That's why it was austere. He did everything he was supposed to do, whatever. The indifference, okay? Why? I was telling my students yesterday in my two token rolling courses, talk about the character Harry Potter. Real love, and we're going to see this in a couple of poems we'll read later on. I'm trying to think how to go about this. Um, where is love directed? Let's say romantic love. Towards someone, Toward someone else. In other words, it's not about me. Okay, so take romantic love out, parental love. A parent's love for a child should be focused on the child. Does that mean little Johnny, little Susie gets everything he or she wants? No. Hopefully not, because then you've raised, you know, a spoiled brat kind of a thing. It's austere because parents have to do things they know Children won't like, right? And the children will rebel. And the children will sometimes say horrible, rotten things. If a parent never has a child say, I hate you, mom. I hate you, dad. More than likely, the parent's not doing everything right. Because there should be times when that should come out. That's the austerity. Notice, but it's not just austere. It's also So why does the speaker end the lines these way? One of you said it. Because I think the speaker is now in dad's shoes. And that could be an indication of the sex of the speaker. <laughs> the speaker is now a father and understands. Why is it a father and why not a mother? Because it's the 60s. 60s could be. To changing gender roles. Why else? Let's get back to the 60s. What do you mean by that? Like your typical nuclear family. Okay. Typical nuclear family, which means? Um, like, what are fathers traditionally? Breadwinners. Breadwinners. Yeah. Okay. Does this imply that, you know, mom doesn't work in the house? Mom's not mentioned at all. Okay. What else? Providers, keep going. Protectors. In other words, this is kind of, I'm not saying that it literally is. It kind of falls within more the traditional role of the father who's the provider, protector, protector, making it warm, making it cozy, you know, all that kind of stuff. So notice, we've just spent 20 minutes at least. 25 or 30 minutes talking about this one poem, unpacking it. How did we do that? Line by line, stanza by stanza, and in many instances, word by word. So when you read any of the poems that are assigned, don't just assume that what you see at the surface level is all that there is. You've, you've got to dig much, much deeper. Okay, so look very briefly at the paragraph that follows. Does the poem match the feelings you have about winter Sundays? Guess what? If you grew up in Florida or Southern California or Southern Texas, you didn't experience a blue-black cold. I mean, it's a very odd situation where Southern Florida gets below 55, all right? Or same with Southern California. For most of us, Sundays are days at home. Notice the assumption there on the part of the editor. 
assuming most people don't go to church, don't have other obligations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They might be cozy and pleasant. They might be dull and depressing. Okay, whatever they are, they're more evocative than say Tuesdays. Why isn't it called those Tuesday mornings? Tuesday falls in what? It's usually the daily week. In other words, it's the nine to five work week. Weekends, most people have off. Unless you're a firefighter, firefighter, nurse, you know, cop, etc. Okay? So, it's a poem about a cold past and a present reverence for his father. His father. You may have noticed the poem doesn't use a masculine pronoun, hence the voice could be a woman's. Does the gender of the voice make any difference? Would it make a difference? Would it make a difference if it was Sundays too my mother got up? Yeah, it would. Okay. Turn the page. Top of the page, what is most important about your initial readings of a poem is that you ask questions. So, let's look at the next poem on that page. Dog's Death. I think I actually have this as one of the assigned poems somewhere in the syllabus. Written in 1969 or published in 1969. Notice the title first and foremost. What's going to happen? Dog's going to die. And I, I, ever since I first taught this poem, I've given this caveat. If you recently had a beloved dog die, you are welcome to get up and leave right now. First time I taught this, I'm not kidding. That morning, one of my dogs, the son of our other dog, got out the garage, ran out in the street, I was running out after him as one of the neighbors down the street was hauling down the street, little subdivision, doing 45, way too fast, and hit my dog. And I rushed that morning. My wife and I took the dog to the vet. He died on the way, bleeding in my wife's lap. That morning, I had to teach his damn poem. And I mean, I was... I really get into my animals, and I was a wreck for a month. I mean, cry like a baby every day. I held it together for this one. So, she must have been kicked unseen or brushed by a car. Just starts off, you know, with a bang. Too young to know much, she was beginning to learn to use the newspaper spread on the kitchen floor and to win. Long pause, because I have to breathe. Wedding there, the words, good dog, good dog. So how old was the dog? Yeah. Just a puppy. We thought her shy malaise was a shot reaction. So that's telling us between the first stanza and the second stanza, they know something happened. The dog's acting differently. They don't know what. They thought it was caused by shot. The autopsy, that tells us pretty quickly the dog's dead. Autopsy disclosed a rupture in her liver. As we teased her with play, man, I can't read. As we teased her with play, blood was filling her skin and her heart was learning to lie down forever. Monday morning, as the children were noisily fed and sent to school, she crawled beneath the youngest bed. We found her twisted and limp, but still alive. In the car to the vets on my lap, she tried to bite my hand and died. I stroked her warm fur and my wife called in a voice imperious with tears. Though surrounded by love that would have upheld her, nevertheless she sank and, stiffening, disappeared. Back home, we found that in the night, her frame, drawing near to dissolution, had endured the shame of diarrhea and had dragged across the floor to a newspaper carelessly left there. Good dog. Okay, so what's the poem designed to do? 
Say that again louder. Be depressing. Be depressing. Be a little more specific. It is sentimental. It is designed to make you tear up. Okay? How? There's some irony there. There's some juxtaposition going on between images. Okay? You know from the beginning because of the title, a dog's going to die. So should it be a surprise that a dog dies within the movement of the pulp? No, it shouldn't. But good dog, good dog, at the end of the first stanza, why does the dog earn the praise good dog? It's being housebroken and learning to use the newspapers. The implication is dog will get older, will learn to wait till it's outside, okay? And then we get the kind of drawn out description how the dog, you know, has a malaise. What's meant by a malaise? Jimmy Carter famously said in 1979, 1980, that the country was in the midst of a malaise. <clears throat> there was a crisis of confidence. You know, that's when interest rates were double digit, mortgages were double digit, student loans were double digit, okay? Everything was double, inflation was double digit, all that kind of stuff, okay? Well, what did he mean by a malaise? It's when you just feel crappy. Nothing's going right, okay? They thought the dog had that from a shot. It's a regular occurrence. What, if you get a flu shot, what might happen? You get sick, you don't get the flu. It's a reaction caused by the shot. I know people, this has happened only once or twice for me, you get the flu shot and suddenly you feel like you have the flu, but it's not, it's a reaction. You get the same aches and pains, etc. okay? Autopsy, ruptured liver, which indicates hard hit. So go back to the first stanza. She must have been kicked unseen. Notice there's no indication, no implication. Who did the kicking? Or brushed by a car. I love that language, brushed. Because brush implies it's a light touch. That's not a light touch, okay? As we teased her with play. That's where, you know, you start tugging at the heartstrings. The dog is dying, and they're like, come here, puppy. You know, throw the ball, and the dog doesn't run. Monday morning, implication is it happened over the weekend. Children being fed go to bed, and the dog does what? It crawls under the youngest's bed. Why under the youngest's? The person who paid the most attention to it. Maybe this puppy was the youngest. When I grew up, you know, we all had pets. Sometimes each of us would have a specific pet. My kids, you know, each had their own pets kind of thing. It could be that kind of situation. We found her twisted and limp. So the dog had to be pulled out from under the bed. Why else would the dog be under the bed? If you've ever had pets and you've had pets die, what do they often do before death? They find them at the safe place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They find a hole, a, a cubby, a den of some kind to curl up in, okay? The dog tried to bite his hand. Why? It's in pain, okay? Go to the final stanza of the last two words. Good dog. What's meant by that? Notice it's ironic. The dog had tried to do what? Use the newspaper one last time. It tried to make its way to the, it didn't reach it, okay? So 
It's sentimental. It's overly sentimental. All right? Let's go on. So, start talking about some terms. Everybody, I'm not even going to talk. Page 596, you know, you've got paraphrase. Everybody knows what a paraphrase is. You put something in your own words. So when you paraphrase a poem, does that mean you have to do it poetically? Nope. What do you do? You reduce it to its bare bones. Okay? So how can you paraphrase dog's death? Got a puppy. Puppy died. Puppy got hit somehow. Tried to help the puppy. Puppy tried to die. Tried to bite me. Puppy tried to use, you know, newspaper. Pretty clear. Um, 6.02 and 6.03. I know we've only got four minutes. 6.02 and 6.03. Verse. Line composed in a measured rhythmical pattern. All, it, all verse means. Verse is, or verses, are lines of poetry composed with a rhythm. The rhythm has to revert, refers to how stressed and unstressed syllables are created. Okay? Anagram, you know what anagrams are. We're not going to talk about that. 604, though it could, an anagram could show up on the quiz. Lick, um, 604, lyric. A lyric is a brief poem, so it's short, okay, that expresses the emotions and thoughts of a single speaker, okay? You could say within Hamlet, the to be or not to be speech is a lyric or is lyrical. It is short. It does have rhyme and meter to it, okay? And it does express the personal emotions and thoughts of a speaker. Here's a short lyric, page on, on 604, Western Wind. Western wind, when wilt thou blow, the small rain down can rain. Christ, if my love were in my arms and I in my bed again. What's the lyric about? Paraphrase those four lines. Notice, this is a really short lyric. The speaker wants what? To be in bed with his lover. Or to be in bed with her lover. Okay? If my love were in my arms and I was in bed. Okay? Implication is kind of, is it going to, is it going to be the next time when the west wind blows again? Bottom of that page, 604. Narrative poem and epic. Poem that tells a story is a narrative poem. John Milton wrote um, Paradise Lost, a poem, oh, this long. It's several hundred pages, okay? Because it is a very long narrative poem. It's an epic. So epic means large, largely. But epics also usually are about not one's feelings. They're about a significant event. Okay? Or an important person. Or the founding of a nation or a group of people. Two of the most famous epic poems in any language are by Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Iliad about the Trojan War, again, big long poem, and the Odyssey about Ulysses or Odysseus's return back home from the Trojan War, okay? Dante's comedy is another epic poem. It's three long books, but it's about one general idea. 
Okay, we'll stop there and we'll pick up. We're still um, in that section, you know, uh, reading and writing about poetry. And we'll probably pick up with. page 606, and we'll go through a lot quicker. Read, um, today's Wednesday, for Friday. We'll finish going through these elements, but also read those two poems that are in your syllabus assigned for November 4th, the author to her book and a valediction forbidding morning.